Welcome to the Quality of Mind Transforming Business Podcast, where we explore the game-changing understanding that can unlock new levels of performance and well-being in the workplace. If you want to be part of the new breed of leaders in business, if you're fed up with the conventional echo chamber, and if you want to be part of a revolution in human potential, then join us to discover the powerful resource that lives before our psychology Hello and welcome to the Quality of Mind Transforming Business podcast series. And today I have another conversation lined up. And my guest who's joining me for this wonderful conversation is Claire Diamond, who is a fellow coach and pointer of the understanding that we always talk about on this podcast show, Quality of Mind. So Claire, welcome to the show. Do you want to give people just a couple of minutes about you and then we'll get into the topic for today? Yeah, sure. Hi, Piers. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, well, I um, I guess how I'm here is because for, for decades and decades, I was feeling there wasn't something right. I really was feeling ill at ease. I had a horror of, of speaking even to more than one person. Um, just always, yeah, going home after events paranoid about what I'd said wrong, how I might have offended people. And so a massive, uh, while doing a, a marketing job, all my spare time really was, was looking at, for me initially, what, what's wrong with me? How, how do I feel more at ease? And so I really did everything <laughs> really everything all the you know all the landmarks all the nlps all the hypnosis all the um meditation all the yoga really all the books everything and it just kept um you know some things helped a bit but but generally that that feeling of being ill at ease didn't really ever go until um i think Well, I did my yoga training and, um, that was the first time ever it had been introduced to me that how reality appears isn't real and how the self appears isn't real. And that, and that, and it was like, it was a full sort of, um, non-dual, you know, month really. Um, so that was, it was, that was fascinating, but it was a lot that I didn't get. I didn't understand. Um. And then I came across um, Michael Neal's Inside Out Revolution and thought, oh, God, right, that's what they were saying. That's, this, now it started to make sense. And so did a lot of work with Michael um, and different other 3P teachers, you know, really amazing that, and a, and a huge, um, a huge falling away of, of, of of a belief in, in this external reality. So all the suffering that was related to that went. And then, um, so I came across Garrett Kramer, who, who took that to a, another space of really, it's not personal, you know, his, he, he, he was, um, very rigorous in saying, you know, this isn't a personal exploration which I couldn't understand at all at that time. And then, and then I started thinking, yeah, because what, what is the personal benefit when actually the self idea is made of the same thought as everything else? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. And so that, and so that brought me here and, and, and now it's, um, full time job work really of writing about this and and I run monthly programs looking at different topics within this you know we've got it to change or relationships or um many or or the self you know all sorts of different things each month and um yeah so I'm really happy to be here and yeah and I've loved our chat so far Piers so yeah real pleasure well, it's it's interesting background and, and not dissimilar to myself in the kind of journey, I guess. And Claire is a very gifted writer. I must admit, I'm very envious of the way you write. Um, I think it's a real talent you have and the way you express everything about its understanding, which is why I wanted to get you on the show, of course, but I would, I'll put some 
uh, links in the show notes, but, um, Claire's books are, uh, I would really recommend, recommend them. They're excellent. Um, now the thing we were going to talk about today, Claire, was, um, how the way we express ourselves and communicate, which now for the audience of this podcast, which is often people in the business world, I mean, that's, that's what we do all day. Yeah. It's wider than that. It's for anyone in anything that we're doing whilst we're alive. But we wanted to talk about how does expression and communication, where does that come from? And what's its relationship with this understanding for people who might have a little bit of a clue about um, listening to some of these episodes before, what we're talking about. So what expression and communication is and, um, and, and just shine the light on that and explore that for a bit. Now, other little topics or big topics actually will probably be will come up um, in that, but that's where we wanted to sort of start and finish and we'll go where we go in, in the middle. How does that sound? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I, I think it's so fascinating because really like the, the heart of what we're talking about is really is a, a, is an, is a, is a concept of self identified and trying to secure itself in everything it believes represents it. And so work, oh my gosh, work is such a, a spotlight on that attempt to be someone, um, ha have my, my products, my projects, everything completely accepted and respected because they are me. And it's all, the whole thing is coming from an idea that we are what we believe ourselves to be and that we, we can be damaged really by any, any, um, by that being made vulnerable. But really what we see, and, and I know you see this in your work, I see it in mine all the time, that actually our true freedom, our our, our, our ability to expand out of our limited conceptual ideas of what we are, what the work is, what our clients are, comes from all of that being fundamentally questioned. Yeah. And this is what's so exciting. Like, this, I, I, I'm sure this will just go through business, you know, but once, once people start actually realizing it, because Either, either we're stuck and vulnerable and insecure and defensive and with all barriers up really because of this idea of self that has to be protected. And we're carrying that round into every meeting, into every client call or, or that whole lot of stuff just looks less and less believable and instead all that's on the call, all that's with the client, all that's doing the strategy is pure intelligence. That's it. Yeah. It's that flow of, of idea, of creation, of, you know, if you think of all the stuff that we've ever done, all the things we know, the books we've read, the people we've met, the, it's, all, it's all there in our subconscious. And, and the more... The more that that's just brought into the space of pure presence and, and pure focus and pure reality, really so powerful. But when it's going through this loop of what do they think about me? How am I coming mm. across? What if I get this wrong? What if, what if I make a fool of myself? What if they decide to go with someone else? That whole loop of self-identity is completely irrelevant and it's, it's just a distraction and a limitation on, on pure creation. Now, there's loads in what you just said. Let me, I just want to unpack a little bit of that and make that practical oh, yeah. for people. It, it, and as you were talking, it reminded me of a conversation I was having with a client with yes, yesterday. And they're in a situation at work where there's some changes going on sort of above them that their boss is changing and a couple of other things are changing. And it was so interesting talking to them because they were getting concerned about well, what does that mean for my projects, my progression, et cetera, et cetera. And 
he and his peer group have been having very com- lots of conversations about, oh my God, what's going to happen here? Blah, blah, blah. And then there'd been a bit of fighting for ground and territory and all this kind of stuff. And that's how we started our conversation. Now, it didn't take long in our conversation, you know, for him to realize what you've just said. Oh, I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, I'm self-identifying with all of that, mm. right? That's, that's not really going on, although it just appears to be. And now I see it, it's just noise. Mm. Right? I don't need to get myself psychologically equipped to deal with any of that because actually what I will need when the changes happen and whatever will just occur to me mm. and it was so simple in a way foundational but simple to see the change and it took you know a, f- a few minutes of conversation of him seeing now this is someone who does I've worked with before so he knows this but he'd forgotten that mm-hmm. we just needed it just nudging back yeah brilliant. and then when you and then the thing the thing you it was in the middle of everything you said there, which is so foundational, is if we don't question what we truly are. Now, yeah. people who regularly listen to your, your work or mine, Claire, they'll know what we mean by that. Right? Mm-hmm. They, 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 they'll know what we mean. But for, for people who are brand, brand new to this, we would first of all recommend go and listen to those other things. But <laughs> if we were to give just a 30 second on what do you mean question who we are? How would you answer yeah. that just in, in the short version? Oh, it's so brilliant. So the short, so what we really are is life or intelligence or consciousness, awareness. Lots of words. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're the space pre-conceptual thought. And and we know that because conceptual thought changes all the time. And yet what we are remains. Yeah. Now, if we see that, see that, see that, recognize, <laughs> and, and anyone can do that in any moment, right? What then becomes fascinating, isn't it? Is that everything that occurs in that space, everything that comes and goes in feelings, sensations, perceptions, thoughts, is an activity arising in that space mm. that includes me and you the Claire and the peers mm. that includes everything Claire or peers might say in a meeting to a colleague to a supplier to whatever yeah right so why do we go around defending that trying to keep that safe you know in our meet well I can't really say that you know in, in the workplace we might go well I can't really yeah I can't really say what I really want to do and or the other one we were we were joking about before we press record was you know that this habit we'll get into when we're trying to get to know someone better you know whether it's it's a potential customer or a partner or a stakeholder we'll take them off site off the out of the workplace for a game of golf or a cup of coffee or a walk right then they might open up more that's what we would say now why would someone not open up more well only because they have this possibly envisioned invisible conditioning saying I can't be Uh, what I want to be in the workplace and the same in relationships and in friendships and you know you know so and that would only be look true to us if we thought that's what we really were now what we're saying is whoa 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 stop go back before yeah what we are is the thing that has the knowing of that self and that arising of those things not the actual things that come and go yeah, brilliant. I love that. Would that make sense to you, Claire? Yeah, it makes total sense. It's so great. I love the way you describe it. And I think also that that takes us on to the, the barrier, especially in work, I think, that people have with this, is that it looks like denial. You know, it looks like, it looks like we're saying none of, the, none of the challenge that they're facing is real. It looks like... We're going to turn them into some sort of pushover that's going to, you know, just let everyone steal their clients and they're not going to meet their targets. They're going to lose their job. And I think what is really interesting, you know, I, I was one of the global marketing directors for Johnny Walker. Um, so I sort of get, you know, I, I, I get that fear. But what is really interesting, I think, is is that 
it it's like a, it's almost like a sort of a psychological cleanness in a way because what you were talking about that the the, the fear that your client had of of what's going to happen you know you know all the all these things that I need to worry about what starts to become clear is that the the fear is because those concepts of me and them and work look real. Mm. So I'm trying to get rid of the fear by worrying about these things that are literally not even happening yet, let alone out of my control. They're not even there. They're just imaginary. And so fear ends because it's, it's tied into a concept. It's tied into a future scenario that's not true. And all attention instead is placed on actually what's real, what is actually happening right now. And that is, creates a sort of conductor, like a conductor between the situation and all our resources, all the full intelligence of life that is represented in this form is like, like a laser on reality. And we're not wasting mental effort, physical energy, attention on the things that are, are just creations of mind and which cannot be resolved ever, no matter how much we think about them. You're know, waking up at three in the morning to think about these things that literally can't be solved because they're not real. And then instead, all attention onto reality. And that's, I think there's nothing more powerful in business, in work, yeah. than, than that. D We've on the pin. Mm. And I, I think it's, you know, and I, you know, luckily lots of past clients would, would, would agree with this, is that what happens is rather than you become some kind of don't care about anything, oh, yeah, do what you want to me, ap apathy, you go the other way, actually. It yeah. just cleans everything up. Mm. You get to obviousness much more quickly. Yeah. And you're less precious and eggshelly and these words make sense, and you, from the right space, say what's need to be said, right? Yes. And they sometimes can be the much tough, let's call it tougher, yes. decisions or conversations, or there's a directness, but a, but a kindness in the directness. Yeah. Um, and all the going around the, the houses and going around the edges and the, oh, blah, 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 the what ifs and disaster casting just fall away. That, 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 yeah. that all seems to dissolve. And as a result of that, you get, you know, because businesses are always after more from less. That seems yeah. to be. They're always changing. So if you can increase your ability to not go around the houses, get to obviousness, be, let's call it braver, um, cut to the chase, pivot, change, be agile. Um, that's exactly what modern business needs. Mm. And that's exactly what happens when people seem to see this understanding. Yeah. Um, so, and I know I'm a little bit biased, but it is the most relevant thing. This but, yeah. in the abstract conversation about the nature of self and reality is yeah. the most relevant practical thing. Yeah. It's the only thing. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I love what you're saying, Piers. It's, it's just, um, as I see it, it, it gets rid of the stuff that's not true. Now, just for my regular listeners, because mm -hmm. I have this <laughs> real but never true kind of shortcut hack mm -hmm. to this understanding. So let's just get clear on what we, <laughs> we're getting into semantics now. But um, the real and true, because you used real earlier and using true now. When I use the phrase real and never true, I'm pointing to the very nature of what experience in reality is. So by real pointing to the fact that everything we experience, whoever we are, whenever, whatever it is, is real, it's visceral, it's sentient. We can see it, hear it, smell it. And it looks like that it's coming from a world out there on the screen of perception, but it's not true. It's not true in the sense of it's not happening outside of the mind. It's not directly causal to us that makes us feel anything or creates anything directly in our experience. And it's never permanent. So that's what I refer to often when I'm talking about whether people see that or not. Do they see 
the real and never true nature of reality because sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. When you say real and true, what do you mean? I mean, I'm going to hold this, but let's see. If we can... <laughs> I, I, what I mean is how, how much of the mind, the mind's energy and attention is, is wrapped up in, in trying to solve or protect or defend things that don't exist outside of imagination. Yes. Yes. So I think, so what I sometimes spend a lot of my time talking to my clients about is when, and we just have a little language like layering and lids where layering is when you're, you're self-identified, you're adding in usually judgment and justification. Yeah. <laughs> symbolism narrative yeah. to the presenting reality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now when you're not layering and, and lids is when you've gone, well, that can't change because of that. You know, when you're not in those, there's just a, there's much more flow in what it perceives and feels and things. And there's more obviousness, right? And it just is. Yeah. It just is. There's no narrative and there's no like, well, that's going on because of this. And that, and because that happened there and, and I should do this because that means this. And, and because they said that, you know, all of that's gone and it mm -hmm. just sort of is. And I, I tell you what fascinates me about that is how obvious it is to see it. When you, do you remember when your kids came home from school and they're about four or five years old and you do that polite question, how is school today? And they look at you and they're like, well, I don't, that was, I'm in this moment, <laughs> right? What, what, what do you mean? But then you learn to be a little bit polite and they go, it was good. Thanks. Right. And then you say, what was good? <laughs> and then I, not that they do this, but I, I imagine, right. They're like, oh my gosh, I've got to try and justify what was good about. This. They don't know. They're just feeling the moment. Right. And then they come up with these, well, because we had maths and I like maths and then we did games and I enjoy that, but I didn't. So, so they then come up with narratives. Yeah. Right. Which oh. are not really <laughs> going on because they, they're in that, that moment was way gone. Right. And then we kind of just, if, if you then amplify that up as we go through life, we spend our life doing that, forgetting we made, not we made them up, but they are just an apparent activity yeah. of the conceptual mind that likes to justify, judge, categorize. Yeah. You know, and it, you could just see it so much in those little kiddies when we try and ask them about how they feel about something. I love that example. I so love almost, that. like, huh? I don't know. But I keep getting asked this question by mommy and daddy, so I better come up with something. <laughs> I, spoke, I spoke to my son on the phone the other day and I said, I said, what are you up to? I said, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No Larry, no lids. It's, yeah. So now at the same time, we're taught to be um, respectful and recognize the self and honor it and hear it. So in the workplace, we would say to, you know, for coaching leaders, we would say, talk to people, hear them. Now I've always found this interesting because actually what we're pointing to there and the magic of being heard, because, you know, if you look a lot of, it used to be the case that lots of, uh, the number one demand on feedback culture surveys was being listened to and heard mm -hmm. right now. What I think is interesting there, because at one level you could hear what we're saying going, well, you're saying don't bother. No, what we're saying is be present and respect and recognize the other avatars of human beings in your organization, right? Because the self doesn't like being ignored. It, it likes being heard when it's coming from that place of insecurity and conditioning that most of us are coming from or were coming from, right? Yeah. So you need, I, I believe as a leader, you know, walking around and chatting to people, well, any, doesn't matter a leader, to any, anyone, and, and, you know, m being there in that moment with them is valid. Yeah. But you're not doing that to kind of, um, you're doing that just to be present and be part of the emergence of the intelligence. Right. Mm. And that's what they're missing because I think that it gets ignored. So does that make sense about being yeah, recognized and heard? You know, I think it, yeah. Like, well, 
before we caught start recording when we were talking about systems i think so i think what you're like there's two really rich things in what you're saying that the first thing as a leader is 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 like to get to the reality of that person as as quickly and cleanly as possible so not through our concepts not through our assumptions all the sets, say, not through what other people have told us but just like how do, how does this system in front of me function best what what do they love doing what are they great at how what conditions you know like everything about as if it like sounds a bit awful but like as if it was a potted plant really in the office like how can how can this plant mm. thrive, really thrive what do i what do they need from me and then the, and then the second thing like what you're saying then because i think that's so interesting how we how we bring these insecure concepts of ourselves to work and then we expect work to make it stable, secure it. In a way, I think really now more and more the role of leaders is to simultaneously enable that system to thrive while coaching that person to move beyond the the need and insecurity and and to move beyond trying to have work as the way of stabilizing the identity because as long as that dynamic is happening there'll be conflict there'll be rows there'll be withdrawal there'll be not stepping up there'll be not saying what we really think so to, to so to have your leadership role as a coaching role that shows someone or models it themselves, like above all, as a leader, really having done that work for ourselves and then coaching our people in in not using these like mini rewards, these mini distractions yeah. of praise and attention, but to expand beyond it. And then I think you've got both. You've, you've really got yeah. thriving. And it's funny because I actually see that as very similar to my role as a parent. Yeah. So I'm helping them be okay in the game of life that they're in and as, as, as human beings and how they see it. Um, and, you know, looking after some of their needs in that. And, but also trying to point them to not fall into the, 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 the invisible, innocent misunderstanding of what they truly are so that they can tap into what is truly there. Yeah. And I think in the workplace, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, now, what well, I, I guess what complicates it in both roles as parent or leader is when you've got your own yeah. noise going on, insecurity going on, right, about what, what's happening, and you're trying to do that to your people. So, you know, I always say to leaders, you've got to start with where you're, you, you. because mm -hmm. if you're trying to go, how can I get my people to be more X, Y, or Z? Well, you've got to look at where you're at in your understanding of, of what you think is going on start there really those people don't exist in the way they appear to yes because then you see it you see it differently because you're they're trying to fix the mirage in a way mm -hmm. so and I, th I think it's very interesting isn't it you know we, we bring this back to a little bit communication and expression and you mentioned modeling which you know back in the day 10 15 years ago i would have given you lots of tools and techniques on how to model you know be like this and breathe like this and stand like this and you know really specific behavioral prescriptions or psychological prescriptions yeah. but now it's so much simpler yeah um i'm not saying it's easier because you have to see it first but it's when that leader is in that space of recognizing and seeing what they truly are, going back to what we said earlier, they kind of permeate, uh, uh, give off, just be that model. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And what then comes to expression and communication, what comes out of the mouth or the body language or whatever is what it needs to be. And that's the beauty of the system being intelligent and synthesizing and just is. And I'm sure people have been in meetings or or whatever's with their with their bosses or whoever and and they've just felt touched by what inspired or reassured or just peace more peaceful. Yeah. yeah. As well as going 
And then the other times they've gone and gone, oh my God, they're saying these things and this means this and this means this because the leader is accidentally giving off a vibe of uncertainty or, or whatever, which is, you know, so not that you can really give it off, but you know what I mean? So if you just, as a, as a listener now, just think about times when you've been in the presence of someone and you've just, not really from what they've said, just got a feeling of okayness. Yeah, I love that, Piers. I love that. And I think, yeah, and I think the, the, for the leader to get to that space is, is really to see how every situation, every, every meeting, every interaction is when, when there is that feeling of tension in us, when there's a, a sense of defensiveness or um, contraction, that situation is a mirror of what is being held onto as a concept of me and my survival. And so we talk about gifts and then, yeah, lots of jokes about how, you know, <laughs> enough of your gifts, but these are gifts for really for the making transparent of all the barriers within us to that pure space of all the things that have to be held on to. And let's just say that again, because it, I think it's so important what you've just said. So, and tell me if I'm getting this right and what I've heard there, Claire, but the way I would hear that is what you see as a leader, as anyone is in, in the world, in the workplace, in your colleagues, in your whatevers, is a beautiful shining mirror of how, where you are at, yeah. your conditioning yeah. or, you know, so actually it's, it's really great to see, oh, the world looks like that or that situation looks like that because it's just going, turn that round yeah. and now you can see where you're at. Yeah. Now, what do we do in the workplace? We look out at the world and we go, well, that needs to change. That needs, that's yeah. wrong. What are they doing there? Yeah. How often do we turn that round and go, well, that's just help, helpfully showing me where yeah. my conditioning is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is, which I think is, I, like, this is the sort of paradox because what you, I love what you've just said, how you said it, because the paradox of that is that it, it ends the resistance really to that group or to that person or that situation. It, it's, it, it takes the mind into a space. Well, we're just going to leave that alone for the moment. Work, see here what it's revealing about my own belief limitations, my own barriers and, and insecurities. And then from that space, go out and really, and from presence really, listen and, and see. So it looks, it looks like we could verge into denial with that. We could verge into not, you know, hiding away, not addressing the things that really need to be addressed, but actually it's, it's the only way to get really into the situation cleanly without, without, without fighting our own reflection. Yeah, because the, there might be listeners here going, what, are you telling me there's no difficult people out there, that, you know, there's no problems in my organization? That's not what we're saying. Just yeah. Super, super clear. I mean, I, what we're saying is that if you want to help your organization in the best possible way, you first of all have to recognize, oh, how I'm seeing it is a reflection of my own conditioning. And then from that knowing and I'm being in that wider aperture space, then go to yeah. do whatever you need to do. Right. Yeah. So, you know, clean the windscreen first or recognize you've got a windscreen with dirt on it first before you just head on off into the world of changing everyone and blaming everyone else. So, so it, again, like we were saying earlier, it helps you deal with people who I'm just using that word difficult in, in inverted commas, a lot of people on the podcast can see, but you know, apparent. It helps you deal with that. Yeah. You have a more solid footing. Yeah. And the sign, the sign of a windscreen that's obscuring is, is resistance, resentment, suffering, contraction. It's all saying, 
you know, cause really, cause then we're just going out fighting, you know, maybe people who remind us of a bully at school or, you know, you know, we're, we're just sort of putting, putting our whole, um, memory system really on, onto these situations that have got nothing to do with that, really nothing, but we're fighting our, our own internal war. And yes. And I tell you a little example of that actually it just occurred to me as you're talking, um, I used to like watch, listening to talk radio stations and stuff like that. And then, cause I used to agree with the people or not agree. And then when I first got into this understanding, you know, 15 years ago, I then, I don't want any of that noise. It's just all people ranting on, raving, blah, 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 blah. I've got no time for it. I just cleared it out of my life. Right. Um, because it just didn't seem helpful. Right. Now I quite like listening to some of that stuff because I, I listen and I can, this, I'm looking at a couple of things, which is always really the same thing is, oh, that's how that person sees that. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'm obviously, there's me listening to that person describing how they're seeing it. Right. So I have to realize yeah, it's not yeah. coming via my avatar. Right. Yeah, but I yeah. quite enjoy that now. I don't get ranty at it. Well, very occasionally, but I'm just like, oh, wow, <laughs> fascinating. And then the host, the radio host show, you know, you can hear their own yeah. way of seeing, but. Whereas before I was trying to get rid of that noise because I just thought, oh, it's all just toxic people. You know, I'm actually like enjoying, it's like watching Netflix. You, you kind of, yeah. oh, wow, yeah, that's, that's going on there. But you see it all with a, a different understanding or grace or frame. I love that. I love that. Yeah, because it's not, it's not any more pressing the buttons of hmm. resistance and my belief system and my way and... Because which are all really related to fear, ultimately, it's it's not happening anymore. <clears throat> it's just it's just space for people, for other beings, for yeah, for everything to be as it is. And and it also just you know there's there's big moves at the moment for diversity and inclusion, and the only thing that would ever stop diversity and inclusion is this. Yeah. You know, you trying to protect and save, rescue, resist this apparent self, right? Yeah. Because without that, in inclusivity just looks obvious. It's automatic. Like, yeah. it, it's, a sim it's like you wouldn't even, que or should we have inclusivity? It, it, you just wouldn't even question it. No. That's yeah. the only place that's anything stopping that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Beautiful. So all the symptoms of the modern workplace, stress, anxiety, pressure, mental health, diversity inclusion issues are all <laughs> what we're saying here is are all stemming from the same issue the yeah same innocent invisible overlooking brilliant brilliant yes i love that yeah so claire we're reaching the end of time um this this apparent time thing uh anything <laughs> you'd like to just you know uh, say at the end, any, any, any thoughts or anything in conclusion for you that might be occurring? I've loved this conversation. Absolutely loved it. And, um, I just, I just really echo what you said just right at the end there, because without, without the mind creating problems and creating separation, there is, there literally is no stress. There are no mental health issues. There, there is no fear. There are no anxieties. It's, it's this understanding before everything. And then, and then from there, go out and change the world. Mm. Yeah. Do this, then go and change it. Absolutely. So, oh yeah, I, I, I ditto to that. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. I will point people to your, uh, resources and your website and stuff. I'm assuming you're okay for people to contact you and uh, any, anything like that. So I'll put all that in the show notes, but thank you once again for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. I could have talked to you all day. So thank you so much. Thank you, Piers. Thanks so much. Okay. So everyone have fun and uh, stay curious and happy exploring. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and want to know more, check out our website at qualityofmind.biz and also feel free to reach out and leave us a review or a comment. Until next time, have fun being curious.